right. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, church. You can come on in. You can continue talking out in the hall, whatever you want to do, but we are going to start our service this morning. Um, it is Family Worship Sunday, and so we do have every generation in the, um, in the room today for us to just unite in worship, which is super cool. So way over here, we have Aiden on drums, which is awesome. And Aiden, what grade are you in? Fifth, maybe, maybe fifth grade. Nine. Are you confident? Almost six. Look at that. Awesome. Almost sixth grade. Adonia on piano. Woo! And Adonia, what grade are you in? Tenth grade. <gasps> Fiona on bass. And what grade are you, Fiona? You're also tenth grade. And we have the youngest of all of them. This. Fine gentleman right here. He's in 10th grade too. All right. He just lied in church. <laughs> awesome. So we just want to, every generation, to just join together and um, give praise to our king. Can we do that? All right. If I can have everyone stand. Mm. Jesus, before we dive in, we just want to say thank you. Thank you, God, for allowing all of us to be here this morning. Jesus, thank you for having a purpose and a plan, and we are excited to just learn more about you this morning and just dive into you, your word, and we just pray that you speak to us, Father. Amen. To the hopeless light, to those in the darkness and death, to light. Now I will light, and you give peace to the restless and joy to homes that are broken. I see you now. I'm found and you open the door for me and you lay down your life to set me free all that I am will serve you Lord you fill those for me and you lay down your life to set all that I am will serve you Lord sing that again and you open the door for me and you lay down your life to set me free all that
Jesus. Our King is alive. Father God, thank you.
church, I want us to, us to, for us to declare what we are saying this morning. We're saying, God, I'm going to make room for you. I am going to step aside, put my agenda, put my desires, put my everything aside so you can come in, Father God. So you can come in and heal the wounds that I struggle with. Father God, that you can come in and free me from the chains of my past. Father God, that you can come in and guide my footsteps that you have perfectly placed for my future. Church, let's not us just sing lyrics. Let us get down to the soul of really what we're singing. And sing this in obedience to our Christ. I want you to just sit in this moment and just spend a few moments listening to what the Holy Spirit is saying. Put aside so I can come in and work wonders in your life. Yeah. 
come on my soul Oh, don't, don't you get your freedom up your song Cause you got a lot worshiping with all the generations here at Renton Christian Center. Take a moment, meet a neighbor, and um, in a moment the uh, service will continue. I am talking, there I am. Well, it's a Sunday morning miracle. I think that you guys quieted down before we ended the greeting time. Good morning. My name is Jody Collins, and I have a few announcements for everybody. Uh, the first one is that there is a gathering on Tuesday mornings around 10-ish called Renewed, and um, 
Thank you. That's what I meant. Thursdays. Thank you. Thursday at 10 o'clock here at the church. Uh, it's just a gathering. Coffee, fellowship, and prayer. And um, Marcy, Pastor Marcy organized that, and it's just been great to get together and do that. Today is Sunday lunch day. Hallelujah. Um, there will be fried chicken. I brought green jello that turned out didn't get weird on me. Um, so please come afterwards to eat and have fellowship and awesome things like that. Um, there is a new connect group starting. Pastor Jan over there is going to be teaching the book of Daniel. And Vicki Johnson, who's back there behind my friend, there, okay, uh, is a host. And it is starting April 4th on Tuesdays from 10 to noon. So if you want to get in the word, um, sign up for that. Yes, somewhere? Sign up somewhere. See Jan. Um, Sunday night, March 26th, is trivia night at 5 o'clock. I heard that it could be like the boomers against the Gen Zers. I'm not sure. Um, but, you know, we, yeah. Anyway, there's pizza provided and child care and um, bring a dessert. Okay, that would be easy. Sign up. Sign up for child care. There's a clipboard out in the foyer. Thank you, Annie. Um, I am going to pray. If you would like to, um, thank you. Uh, there are many ways to give. If you call RCC your home, you can text it to a phone number. If you're like, you know, savvy like that, you can write out a check and put it in the box in the back. You can do it online. Um, our church is blessed to have the support of many, many people, and we are blessed also to um, give away what we have out of our abundance to support other people. So anyway, let's pray for our morning. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, we do throw up our hands, and we surrender to make room for you today, God. We thank you for your word. We thank you for fellowship. We thank you for all the people who are watching online and for the people here in the house. We thank you, God, that you are with us when we gather in your name, Father God. And we pray that you would continue to bless your word and the worship and um, offerings and tithes to support the work that you do, Lord God, in this house, Father. Bring your presence through our pastor, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Jody. You can just walk that back and give it to Brandon. Hey, good morning, church. Okay, green jello. That's what I've heard. Green jello. Uh, today for lunch, we also have fried chicken and baked chicken for those of you that uh, eat that stuff. Um, I brought a Caesar salad. It's really convenient. It comes in a bag. And so uh, please stay if you haven't uh, made lunch plans. And even if you didn't bring anything, there's always enough. You can have a half a piece of chicken. Um, there's always enough. And plenty of jello for everybody, Jody, I'm sure. Okay. Did you really, Jody? So this is brother and sister right here. Okay, survey time. Cottage cheese in your jello, raise your hand. Oh. Okay, and, and thumbs down. Janari's gagging over here. Thumbs down, okay. All right, okay. No, Jake? None. Just, how about fruit cocktail in Jell-O? Yes. That's how I grew up. That's how I grew up, fruit cocktail. You know, and it, we all fought for that one cherry that was in it. You know, remember the little ha one cherry, the half a cherry? Yeah. So I throw up my hands and I praise you again and again. And just the picture I have when we were singing that song is, um, you know, I'm a dad, and probably one of the coolest things to be a dad is when you have a toddler. My, I no longer have a toddler. Um, he's 34 years old now, but he has kids, so they're like that. And so when they raise their hands to you and just say, pick me up, like, pick me up, um, 
That's just, that just melts you, right? It just melts you. And we have a Heavenly Father who invites us. I just want to keep reminding us that He invites us to come to Him again and again as we are. He doesn't ask us to clean ourselves up. He doesn't ask us to do anything else but to come to Him. And it's amazing when we do what He does. Um, just that comfort and that peace and the, the, in, in, the joy inside. We're going to be talking about joy this morning a little bit. But can you just close your eyes with me just for a moment? And I just want to say publicly thank you to our um, worship pastor, Ashley, uh, for leading and, and her husband, Mitch, for leading the band and for our, our band members this morning, our worship team, for leading us into his presence and and singing a song that says, I will throw up my hands, I will lift up my hands. And for some of us, this is all we've got. is to lift our hands to him. So I invite you, if you are, feel comfortable this morning, there's no pressure here. My eyes are closed, I can't see anything right now. But I invite you, would you lift your hands to him? And let's just come to him. Let's like physically say, I am moving towards you, Jesus. And I praise you again and again this morning. Lord, as we open up your word, as we see what you have to say to us, we turn our focus on you right now, not our circumstances, not the stuff that we're going to do after church, not even lunch, not even jello, but you, Jesus. <laughs> Jesus, we look to you in your name. Amen. Well, I'm excited this morning because we're starting a brand new uh, series called Blessed Are. And you might like, oh, that kind of sounds familiar. Yeah, that's the Beatitudes. And um, we're going to be studying over the next several weeks the Beatitudes, the Blessed Are statements that Jesus made in Matthew chapter 5. And as I was kind of preparing for this this week, um, I got a text message yesterday from my buddy, Dana Buck, and he said, hey, you guys are starting a brand new series. And he goes, I did. We just finished uh, doing, he wrote eight stories um, on the Beatitudes. And so he said, hey, just raise it, hold up my card. So Dana, if you're watching, how much do I get for holding this card up in front of the church? Just kidding. We're buddies, so. I love him with all my heart. He's an amazing man. We've been best friends since, well, I won't put a date on it, but the 90s. So, um, so yes, if you're interested in hearing the Beatitudes told in story form, and many of you, I listened to one yesterday. It had uh, Terry and Fiona in it. It had Ruth uh, in it. It's, they're, they're fantastic. And so they're right outside that door on the right. It's posted. There's a bulletin board, and you can grab one of these, and he has all his stories up, but uh, him and Brandon work on Tuesday nights, and Brandon's done a phenomenal job, I want to say, under blue skies? Beneath. Beneath, oh, I was so close, Beneath Blue Skies Productions is Brand Brandon's little gig, so it's uh, pr pretty neat, Beneath Blue Skies, and his middle name is Sky, and his last name is Blue. So, beneath blue skies. I love that. All right, so turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5 this morning. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 5. Again, this is the Beatitudes. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. We have tons of Bibles. Would love for you to follow along. I know some of you follow along with your phones, but would love for you to follow along. I am going to put up some slides. I'm learning to do slides because some of you have told me, would you put some slides up once in a while? So here's one. <laughs> it's a good start, Matthew chapter 5. And I, oh, there it was. There it is again. Oh, it's flashing back here. I don't know what's going on. Anyways, and I purposely have not done slides for the time that I've been doing this 
mainly spe specifically with the, the Scripture verses, because I want us to be able to turn to our Bibles, to, to open them. I mean, I use my Bible app during the week as well, but there's nothing like actually open up the, opening up the pages of, of, of the Word and, and being able to find Matthew chapter 5. And so I will have some Scripture verses up here periodically for you this morning, but we're mainly going to just turn, turn in, the, in our Bibles and find it ourselves. So Matthew chapter 5, I want to read verses 1 and 2. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. This is not Jesus' first public appearance Jesus has showed himself. He has been busy. He's been doing all kinds of stuff uh, at this point. Now, Jesus is about 30 years old in this passage. And, and just looking at Matthew, according to Matthew, if you turn back a few pages, you don't have to do that right now. But according to Matthew, Jesus has been busy. Matthew chapter 1 is this incredible genealogy of Jesus. And a lot of times if we just read that, you're like, I, why are they saying who, who his great, 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 great grandfather is and his great, 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 great grandmother is? So Matthew records through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit the family tree the family line of Jesus. And what's so interesting when we read that, a lot of us, we just skip over the genealogies. But as I'm reading now through the Old Testament again and seeing some of those stories and those names, as I read through Gen or Matthew chapter, five, chapter 1, those names that I'm reading about in the Old Testament are popping up in that genealogy. In fact, we, I, Heather and I just read when Rahab helped the spies, she hid them in the basket or hid them in the room and then lowered them down with the basket, which is an incredible story. And here's the unique thing about Rahab. She was a perfect woman. <laughs> and some of you believe me, but she was not a perfect woman. She was a broken woman. She was a woman who, as far as we know, the only way she knew how to make money was to sell herself. And so she was a prostitute. She is in the line of Jesus. Because she believed, she left her lifestyle of sin, and she followed Jehovah God. She was the only one, her and her family, the ones that were in her room that was on the wall, when the Jericho walls fell and crashed to the ground, that would have been a crazy sight to see. Somehow her room was okay. And she was rescued where everybody else was lost. We see Boaz, who is the kinsman redeemer of Ruth. And we just see that whole storyline. We see David. We know about the stories of David. We know about how he messed up. And yet, God redeemed him still. And Solomon is in the line of Jesus. Jesus has been busy. He visited, uh, was visited by, according to Matthew, he was visited by the wise men. Um, this is one of my Christmas pet peeves. I did a series called PK's Pet Peeves at one point, way back in the day, on Wednesday nights. Because the wise men weren't there at Christmas. So if you have a, if you have a nativity scene and you have wise men, you need to put them about... 20 feet away, <laughs> because, because they're still journeying to find Jesus. And we know that because when they do find Jesus, he's a toddler. He's around, around two years old. And the reason why we know that historically is because when Herod found out that there was a new king being born, he massacred. This is something we don't talk about, but he killed all the boys two years and younger. And so before he did that, 
God gave Joseph a dream. You need to go to Egypt. Interesting. Go back to Egypt. So they went to Egypt. I, I told you Jesus was busy up until this point. Born, being a toddler, went to Egypt, was there for a while, came back. Still didn't feel quite safe, and so Joseph settled in the town of Nazareth. And then silence for 25 years or so. We don't know anything about Jesus' youth. Did he go to youth group? Do they have youth group? I actually don't see youth groups in the Bible, but we do it anyways because we want to provide a safe place for our kids to come and be and hang out. And when, when Jesus does show up, he shows up to be baptized. And so I do want you to turn in your Bibles. Actually, you know what? We'll just do this. I have it on a slide for you. <laughs> I hear a gasp. So 25 years of silence, and then Jesus comes Onto the scene, and it says this, Then Jesus came from Galilee to Jordan to be baptized by John. John was his cousin, John the Baptist. But John tried to detour him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? And Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. And John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, now picture what's going on here. So Jesus is baptized. It's such a beautiful picture. Baptism is such a beautiful picture. As Jesus goes down, at that moment, heaven was opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him, landing on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We could spend all Sunday morning just talking about this passage. Heaven opening up, the Holy Spirit shows up on Jesus, the Anointed One. And with God says, this is my son whom I love and whom I am well pleased. You know, Jesus hadn't done really anything publicly at this point. And yet, God says to him, I am well pleased. Baptism is a beautiful picture of us dying to ourselves. Jesus, fully God and fully man. Now, can we really get our minds around that? Not really. But Jesus dying to his will. Because Jesus knows what's coming in three years. He's going to die on the cross. He's going to die for the sins of the world. So Jesus being baptized is saying, God, not my will be done. But you will, I'm, I'm dying to myself here. And that's a beautiful picture. This is what baptism does. And so baptism is a powerful thing. We are actually going to have baptisms on Easter Sunday here. And so um, if you're interested in being baptized, if you are saying, well, there's a couple of you here. And you're probably saying, oh, is that me? Is this talking about me? I might be. And maybe you're at home. Baptism is when you first become a Christian, when you first say yes to Jesus, one of the first things he asks us to do is to be baptized. And why? It's because it's a picture of us dying to ourselves when we go into the water and then coming back up as a brand new person in him, a whole new future ahead of us. Um, baptism is an incredible experience. Maybe you've known Jesus for a long time, but you've never been baptized. Well, this is the time. I've talked to a lot of Christians who have known Jesus for a long time, weren't baptized back, back in the time when they gave their lives to Jesus. And now they feel like, well, it's kind of too late for me to be baptized. 
Or, real moment here, I don't want to look messy in front of people. You know? I don't want to, my hair is going to be a mess. My makeup might run. I, you know, I, I've heard that all, right? And it's not, it's, again, it's dying to ourselves. It's not about, who cares? We're going to celebrate you. That's what I love about our church is when, when baptism happens, when you're coming up out of the water, all you hear is celebration. It's better than any sporting event ever. And if you know me, that's a big statement. It's new life. So we're going to do that on Easter Sunday. And Jesus goes from this mountaintop experience of being baptized and having heaven open and then having the Holy Spirit ascend on him and hearing his Father's voice. He goes from that moment to probably one of the hardest moments in his life. From mountaintop to valley. Not just valley, but to desert valley. And he, could, he's encounter, he encounters the devil there and is tempted, that's recorded, tempted three times in 40 days. In his weakness while he's fasting, while he's praying, while he's spending time with his father, he's tempted. And how does Jesus... Communicate with the enemy. He uses the Bible. And here's the interesting thing. The enemy uses the Bible. This book is an incredible book. I can't say enough about it. It can use, be used in amazing ways. But it also has been used in very hurtful ways ways as well. So it's really important that we, we take this book seriously and we use it for the glory of God and not for the glory of ourselves and our opinions and what we think, any of that. So the enemy comes to Jesus and tempts him by twisting the word of God and then Jesus sets him straight. This is what the word really says. Like I said, Jesus has been busy. Then he begins to teach and to preach a little bit. Um, in fact, some of his first public statements that are recorded in Matthew, in Matthew chapter 4, says, Jesus was going around and says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. We're going to get, read that verse a, a little bit later. But repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. What he is saying is, Kingdom of heaven is here. I'm here. So it's time to reconsider. It's time to turn around. It's time to look to me, is what Jesus said. And he began to teach, and he began to, as he's walking through uh, Galilee in that area, he was sharing the good news of the kingdom of God, and he was healing um, those who were broken. And the Bible records in Matthew that there was not a disease or human things that we face that Jesus could not heal, that he could not repair. Everything from um, physical ailments to um, even mental ailments to demon possession. Jesus was able to heal and touch all who came to him. Obviously, when that is happening, a crowd gathers, a large crowd gathers, and that's where we pick it up here. And how many of us, I would say, here are ambiance people? Ambiance. And when I say, uh, yes, I just heard a big, uh, oh yeah. Somebody at home I know right now is a huge ambiance person. My wife, Heather, likes ambiance. Let's go to a restaurant where not every light is on, it has to be soft lighting. It has to be kind of, you know, set the, set the tone, right? So let me ask that question. How many of you guys are ambiance people? Yes. Yeah, I'm totally there. And what I love about what Jesus does here, so this massive crowd has gathered, and it says that Jesus went up on the hillside, and he sat down. 
And what's significant about that? There's a couple things. Jesus is setting an ambiance there, a place of safety, but also in that, it's a place that is known. Because how do the rabbis teach? The rabbis would teach by sitting down. So it was something that was comfortable for them. They understood that. But I also believe that when Jesus sat down as a rabbi to teach, he was taking on the authority. He was taking on authority. That the words that are going to come out of my mouth are important. And you best be ready to receive them, to listen to them, and then to walk in them. The last word in the Old Testament in Malachi is the word curse. Some of you are looking it up right now. Some translations use the word destruction, but many translations use uses the word curse. And it's super interesting. And then, and then after that, 400 years of silence from God. So the last word written to Israel from the prophet is curse. And the very first sit-down, massive public address to Israel from Jesus is blessed. What a contrast. Blessed are. So we're going to read it this morning. Super simple, it's right there. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let's not stop there. There. Open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5 if you're not there. I want to read all the Beatitudes to you this morning, all the blessed ours. We'll read them every week as we study this so we know them. Jesus said, he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. That's our baptism Sunday verse, by the way. It's going to be awesome. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And I'm going to keep going. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Blessed are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If you look in the original translation, in the original writings, Greek, the word blessed there is, can be translated in many words. Most of the time, it's actually translated happy, which was like mind-blowing to me, because we don't really talk about happy in the church. Normally what we talk about is joy, because happy is based on our circumstances, where joy doesn't matter what our circumstances are, joy comes from God. And we can be in the worst of circumstances and still experience this incredible joy that doesn't even make sense in the circumstances that we are, but we have it. We're not happy in that moment, but we have joy. The definition of joy, a lasting emotion that comes from the, our choice to trust God, that he will fulfill his promises. If you're lacking joy this morning, my encouragement to you is to trust God. If things in your life right now are not going very well, it's not good. The newest song on the radio that I, I quoted last week, I'm going to quote again this week. 
If it's not good, then he's not done. If it's not good, he's not done because God is good. And we might be in these circumstances that are very difficult, but we can still have joy because we know that God will fulfill his promises. But Jesus here says, happy are the poor in spirit. So Jesus is talking about here, he is talking about circumstantial happiness because if we're poor in spirit, we'll have, we're, we're happy because we have the kingdom of heaven. Happy. We are happy because we recognize our need for him. Poor in spirit, that's what that means. It has nothing to do with what's in our wallet, in our purses, in our bank accounts. He's not talking about poverty here in the way when we think of poor. What he's thinking of, he's talking about poverty of spirit. And when we recognize that we need him, that's when we are blessed. That's when Jesus says that we are happy. How can we ha- be happy in that? Because we know that the kingdom of heaven is ours. We are happy because we recognize our need for him. We are happy because heaven is our home. And what do we know about heaven? I'm going to open it up here. And if you're at home, you can text me, even though my phone's not on me, but I'll read it later and respond to you. My number is 206-941-0959. And if you start messing with my phone, I will delete you. But, <laughs> but that's okay. Start off good, and then we'll see from there. What is heaven? What do we know? And I'm going to open it up here. What do we know about heaven? Go. So it's where God is. It's above. Pearly gates. Okay. Streets of gold. There's many rooms. It's eternal. Food. Are you talking about our Sunday lunch? Will there be jello and cottage cheese in heaven? <laughs> okay, it depends who you are. He says he sets a table before us. If you like jello with cottage cheese, I'm sure it'll be there. If you don't, then move on. Have something else. What? So Jesus has gone, well, we know about heaven that he is. Right now, he's, pre- he's preparing that place for us, is what Jesus said. What else do we know about heaven? We don't talk about heaven enough, but what do we know about heaven? Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, yes. There'd be no crying or weeping or sorrow or pain. Is that good news? That is huge news. There will be no sorrow. There will be no weeping. There will be no pain, anguish, or tears. There will be no frustration. It's just going to be heaven. Yeah, Bill. It is beyond our comprehension. Your last one, Fiona. It's 24-7 in his presence. And when we're in the presence of God, it will, it's not like we're going to go there for, because I have some buddies that they're not really into worship. But when we, when we say worship, we always mean this. But worship's not just this. There's, when we're in heaven, there's just going to be this, it'll, just our, our awe and wonder of who he is will just flow from us. Yes, there's going to be music in heaven, incredible music in heaven. What else are we going to be doing in there? Not really sure. But I do know what we will be worshiping him because we'll be in his presence. One of my favorite passages in, in the Bible that talks about heaven is there, there won't be, we won't need light. There won't be the moon or the sun or the stars that create light for us because he is light. 
And Michael mentioned pearly gates. Do you realize that in Revelation chapter 21, John does describe the streets paved with gold. And the gates, there's 12 gates that represent the 12 tribes of Israel. And each gate is not just made out of pearls, but each gate is a pearl. That is a big pearl. (laughs) 12 big pearls. Imagine the oyster from that. It's huge. Heaven's an amazing place. Blessed also means... Fortunate. Fortunate are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It also means well off. Well off are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It could also be translated envied. Envied are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And can I just say that when peop- people look at you as a follower of Jesus, there should be envy. People should be able to look at us and say, there is something different about them. And I want that. As opposed to what is kind of happening even in the church today is people look at the church and say, I don't want anything to do with that. There's a disconnect there for us. Envied are the poor in spirit. Have we humbled ourselves and recognized that we really do need him? That's what it means to be poor in spirit. When we say, God, there's nowhere else I could go. So I throw up my hands and I praise you again and again. Because all I have is a a hallelujah, which means a praise means praise the Lord. All I have is to praise you. Poor in spirit. Poor means destitute without the basic necessities of life. And what do we as human beings need to live? We need food and we need water. Here's the amazing thing about Jesus. He knows what we need spiritually and physically. And so Jesus speaks that way to us and says to us in John, I am the bread of life. Those who come to me will never go hungry. Being poor in spirit means we recognize our need for him and know that we can't go anywhere else but to him to have our needs fulfilled. In John chapter 7, Jesus says, it says, On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Jesus knows that we need physical bread and physical water to survive. But he also tells us that he is our spiritual bread. He is our spiritual water. And unless we have him, we cannot survive. He is our everything. Being spiritually poor means we recognize our need for him, that we hunger and we thirst after him. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Psalm chapter 42. Right in the middle of your Bible. We're going to read the whole thing. You might recognize songs that have been written out of this. If you've been around the church for a while. We don't sing them very often here, but once in a while we bust, bust it out. Psalm 42, you're on page 484 if you have a church black Bible. As the deer pants for streams of water, 
So my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Now, the writer of this psalm is poor in spirit. He's in incredible, tough circumstances. We're going to read about those circumstances, but I love how he starts off and he just makes that declaration. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one, with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God. He's talking to himself here. Anybody talk to themselves? Anybody do that? Yeah, if you watch me work around my house on the projects that's going on, I'm always talking to myself. And the writer here is doing the same thing. Why are you so downcast? Why are you disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me, therefore I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, from the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mazar. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is within me. A prayer to God of my life, to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Anybody ever ask God that question? I have. Pastoral confessions. I've totally asked that question before. Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying all day long, where is your God? Why, my soul, are you so downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Being poor in spirit has nothing to do with, again, what's in our pockets, what's in our bank accounts. It's recognizing our need for him. Matthew 4, 17. Right before the Sermon on the Mount, right before the Beatitudes, it says this. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent. We're going to pop all the way down to the very last line. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is the Amplified Version of the Bible. The Collins got me going on this, this version of the Bible because they use this a lot. And they will have comments and stuff that will help us grasp sometimes what the original language is saying. And right here it says, repent. And what does that mean? What does it mean to repent? It's to change your inner self, your old way of thinking. It means to regret your past sins and to live your life in a way that proves repentance. To seek God's purpose for your life. So Jesus is saying, repent, change the way you think. Realize that it's all about him. If we want heaven, the only way we're going to have heaven is in Christ. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I want to invite you to stand with me this morning. If you can stand, you don't have to stand. I'm going to invite Ashley and Mitch to come back up this morning. 
We sang a song this morning that says, uh, I will make room for you to do what you want to. So as we close today, I guess the questions, I always ask questions. So whose kingdom are we living for? Are we living for our kingdom and the things that we want, or are we living for his kingdom? And what is the state of my soul? Am I poor in spirit, or am I self-assured in my spirit? And when I mean self-assured, it's... It's basically, I don't need, God, I don't need you. I've got it. And for those of us that say that, it just simply means that we're blind to the truth. Because this is what the Bible said, that God opposes the self-assured. But he invites, he welcomes those who are poor in spirit and who are humble before him. In fact, the Bible says that he gives grace to us. Poor in spirit, again, means we recognize our need for him. And when we give our lives to Jesus, we have new life. Our sins are forgiven. We have a hope and a future. This sense, incredible sense of peace comes over us and this remarkable joy bubbles up from the inside. And he even gives us moments of happiness. So Lord, we make room for you this morning to do what you want to do. And church, I just invite you to come forward this morning if, if you just want somebody to pray for you or even if you want to just stand just with Jesus. To come poor in spirit this morning and recognize your need for him. We have some incredible people that would love to pray for you. So just as we sing this, just a little bit, we're not going to linger here long. I invite you to come. We invite you to come and be prayed for this morning. This morning, Lord. And we acknowledge that we need you today, Jesus.
So Lord, this is not just a prayer that we sing this morning. God, this is a prayer that we want to carry into our week. God, we would make room for you to move in us, to work in us, but also to flow through us, Lord. That those streams of living water would bubble up from the inside and, and just flow in us and flow over us, Lord. God, we thank you for loving us. We thank you that you give us everything that we need. You are the bread of life. You are living water to our souls. So I pray for the downcast this morning. Lord, that you would be the lifter of their heads. That they would see you. That they would recognize their need for you. They would make that declaration that they need you. And when they do that, you would remind them that heaven, heaven is theirs. Hmm. So thank you for heaven, God. For those of us that have said yes to you, thank you that you do give us a hope and a future in you. Lord, we pray over this lunch this morning. And we're thankful that you provide everything again that we need. Even the physical needs that we have, you give us and provide for us. In Jesus' name. And the church said? Amen. 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 Really invite you to uh, stick around and have lunch and, uh, and fellowship, break bread together. It's, it's a special thing when you are able to do that. So God bless you.